Warning, what you are about to hear is two guys talking completely unfiltered. Cut, cut, cut. What are you doing? We don't do disclaimers. The show's called Totally Unprofessional for a reason. I'll see what you did. You're wasting our intro time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start the show. They'll probably wait till after the bye week. You know, that's what, uh, there was a lot of reports on uh, on uh, Sunday or Monday over there. We were watching all kinds of shit. It was like, this is Tony Romo's team. And yeah, like, the quote, like, it was all big. Dude, it said, like, Tony, Tony people, Romo's our number one quarterback. People were pissed off, dude. About that? Cowboy fans were going nuts. I asked you this on the podcast about if Dak Prescott has become Tim Tebow in Dallas. No, I, I think that enough people, um, I think that enough people like him. Um, for some reason, people just didn't like Tim Tebow outside of Josh. No, if you were in Denver, <clears throat> you were begging for him to play. Yeah, but uh, again, especially after he won. But again, the scenario—it's a different scenario because there wasn't anybody waiting in the wings with Tebow. Tebow didn't have anybody. Uh, no, there were he people, wasn't feeling. Who was it that was know? ahead of him? Uh, it wasn't Cutler. Oh man, I don't even know. It was somebody ahead of him that kept fucking up, and he got and he got in. Yeah, you know that he wasn't a fill in, like an injury fill in. He was he was legit playing. So, uh, well, we're back. We have uh, back after a uh, one day hiatus. We had some technical difficulties on Friday. Yeah, so we were unable to pod. I was gonna pod from Dallas, um, but those fans were uh, a little bit. No, I want to say unruly, but. The podcast would have been a whole lot of just yelling and screaming at me is all it would have been. And I was like, and I told my brother, he's like, we were in a bus on the way back to the hotel. And he's like, dude, when we get on this podcast, I'm just going to give you shit. And that's all it's going to be. I was like, then we're not doing it, man. That's not what we do. And he's like, no, no, it it has to be what I want. And that's what it's going to be. I'm like, no, fuck you, then. We're not doing it. So, uh, and plus, I don't know if he was drunk or not, but uh, (laughs) it was. uh, Definitely at least feeling it. He pretty much laid it out like, okay, we can't do this. I I told him, we can't do this. I'm not going to do this. I don't care how much you beg and plead now. You know, I'm not going to, we're not going to go on and it's not just going to be a bangle bashing fest. Not that I don't feel like we deserved it, but still, you know. So, uh, did you have tears in your eyes yesterday? Did you see the farewell? Is that your, oh, you're barely watching it? I saw it yesterday, but I was watching the ESPN <clears throat> yeah. clip together. Yeah, he was walking off the field. Um, Big Poppy's last game. Sad yeah. to go out that way. Um, sad to go out in a sweep. I mean, shit. How you're good, talking about one of the hottest teams offensively rolling into the playoffs, yeah, but and how, they do nothing. But how good is Cleveland, though? They weren't as good you know? as people had them down to be. They were facing injuries. Like, Don't get me wrong. Their pitching staff was strong. Obviously, they had a better record to have home field. Yeah. And they won the <clears throat> AL Central. But... Just by and large, <clears throat> excuse me. Overall, they weren't anything that was a daunting task for the Red Sox. You know, the guy who wins twenty two games on the year shows up in game one and just gets berated. Well, let's just say he didn't show the up. The two hundred and ten million dollar <laughs> man gets smoked. Yeah, you know, gets blanked. It was a shutout loss yeah. in that one. And then last night, you know, they had an opportunity with two outs, two men on, full count, and he and they flew out. You know. Yeah. Um, it's sad to, to go out that way. It is. Uh, they had a potential to make a run, you know, uh, yeah. for sure. But would have been a hell of a finish. It, you know, it, it sucks. But not every storybook gets the fairy yeah. tale. Yeah, you know, and, and you know what? They gave him his his uh, his farewell last night. I mean, you know, there's. I don't remember the last time I saw an adoring crowd. I mean, when uh, Jeter went out, you know, even Rivera, you know, the Yankee fans were real appreciative. But that last night was different. Mm. You could tell with the crowd reaction and. They were panning through the crowd a lot. It was pretty cool to see that. 13 years he played for the Boston Red Sox. Yeah, I mean, as much of a, a franchise player as you're going to get in baseball, you yeah. know, you just don't see that that often. They run the money. They run the circumstances where you can win a, a ring. Mm-hmm. You know, he legit stayed there. He's got his rings, you know. Mm-hmm. Three of them. He'll be... 2004, uh, 2007, and he'll, 2013. He'll be first ballot Hall of Fame. And 13, he was the MVP. Uh, he'll be first ballot Hall of Fame, no doubt. Yeah. You know, so uh, hats off to Big Poppy on his career. Uh, yeah, I mean, I got to see him twice this year. Yeah, uh, that was cool. Uh, over his career, I was there in Oakland for career four hundred home yeah, that's run. Right. So that was cool. You know, that's a historical moment for him that I yeah. got to be there and see. So I mean, that that was cool. But but definitely sad because <clears throat> he's not somebody that's going to be replaceable. Yeah, definitely. He, he's the mo- He has the most home runs all time by somebody in their final year. Uh, with the, he had thirty six. Wow. Uh, and again, the quote was, "You're playing at such a phenomenal level, 
why walk away now? And the answer was because my body can't physically do it anymore. And you're talking about somebody who's going to go down as the greatest designated hitter of all yeah, time. Yeah, definitely. You know, sorry to all you Mariners fan. Edgar Martinez is now second fiddle <laughs> to uh, David Ortiz. But, I mean, he still sees the ball. Yeah. He still has the power. Yeah, he showed that. that but, I mean, I mean, he's 40 years old, over 40 years old. And and he said his feet were his hurt. Feet were... His feet is this biggest issue. His feet and his heels. Uh, every day he has to get treatment on him before every game. Yeah. You know, and, and he doesn't field. He doesn't play the field. That's just yeah. having to be able to get around bases. Yeah. You know, and at some point, we've talked about this, that quality of life after baseball yeah. or football or yeah. whatever sport you play. And it's a little different yes. for him because he is 40 in his 40s. Mm-hmm. He's older. It's not like you're 30 and you're like, okay, I got to start thinking about this because I got... This guy's 40. It, his body has legitimately started turning the other way. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to start absorbing the age a little more when you get into your 40s. Um, every athlete will tell you that. Uh, we're waiting for it to hit Tom Brady, yeah. you know. But your body eventually makes a turn towards, I don't want to say shutting down, but towards slowing down maybe. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't heal as fast. You know, you're, you're, it, there's just things that are different. And for an athlete at that level, I would say the biggest part is the healing. Because when you do get hurt, you don't know if it's going to be permanent. You don't know if you're going to recover 100% from it. You know, when you're in your 30s, especially in your 20s, you feel invincible. You'll go out and you'll do things and you get through them most of the time. You know, every once in a while, there's that injury that you just can't overcome, but we don't see that very often, especially with medicine the way it is. When you're 40, man, things start to hurt. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't go away that easy, you know? So, but again, you know, you don't got to be uh, a Red Sox fan to appreciate that. You know, he's a great player, phenomenal player. Uh, I'll definitely remember him, too. You know, when people talk about DHs, you're, he's going to be the, he's the measuring stick now. Yeah. You know? Uh, they announced, as we <clears> said, <throat> in the last game of the season that he's going to, have his number retired there. Yeah. So nobody will wear 34 ever again for the yep. Sox. Uh, that's cool. And then uh, last night they gave him his whole like send off. He came out in the eighth for a pinch runner. And then after the game was over, he stood there, you know, tipping his head yeah. with a curtain call with tears he was in crying his eyes. Too. Yeah. yeah, you get. You get I mean, it's a tough. A lot of people talk about you know, oh, we have the best fans in the world and this and that. But when you go to certain places, it's different. Yeah. You know. Um, New York, that's it's a different place um, because it is New York City. So they love the Yankees, they yeah. love the Mets. You know, Chicago is another one. If you're a Cubs fan, you're not a White Sox fan. Yeah, you know, um, and you go to certain places like that. When it comes to football, you know, definitely, you know, Wisconsin and yeah. Green Bay, you know, that that type of stuff. But when it comes to Boston, they are a major sports city. You know, Pittsburgh's yeah. another one with their hockey team and their football team. Yeah. You know. That, that that's what they're all about. And Boston's in that same boat when you think of the Patriots, the Bruins, yeah. the Red Sox, the Celtics. Uh, and in that city, they have a history of winning. And so they, you know, they revere their athletes yeah. on a different level than other towns and cities do. And, and so I think, you know, we've heard it say it a million times, being a Celtics and a Red Sox fan, how they bring in free agents and they're like, this is this place is just different. Yeah. You know, and, and you could feel that last night, like you said, that like you could see that no matter what you want to say about him, he's never been busted for PEDs. Yeah. Um, he's the reason why they stayed alive in 2004 in the ALCS against the Yankees. He hit the game-winning home run and the game-winning hit that took them when they were down three games to none and took them back in other games that, at home that brought them back in games that went deep. Um, that He's the Yankee killer is what yeah. they called him, you know. Um, in the 2013 World Series, he was the MVP hitting over 400. I mean, it was un- unbelievable. And yeah. you're talking, like, this was just three years ago. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like that's crazy. Yeah. Like, to think that you were you were almost 40 hitting 400 in the, the World Series. Yeah. You know, like, that's bananas. And he, at the time when he came in, Manny Ramirez was there. Nomar Garcia yeah. Parra was there. Uh, Pedro Martinez was there. That's right. You know, there was a lot of guys who you could have said, this is our franchise guy. Yeah. But then once he came into his own there, it very quickly became his team. Yeah. And, and they had enough stars there that, like, you could have went, well, this guy's our guy or that guy's our guy. Josh Beckett, Mike Lowell, you know, Kurt Schilling with the bloody sock, you know. Yeah. All these guys that have come along on that team, and, and he by far is, has been the face and, and been – he'll be revered on the Mount Rushmore of Red Sox with Ted Williams and Carl Ustrimsky, you know. Yeah. He's, he's in that conversation with those guys as the greatest Red Sox and greatest players to ever play the game of all time. Nice. So, happy retirement. Hope he enjoys it. You know, I'm sure we'll see him again here and there. Mm-hmm. He's bound to a sportscast or something. You know, he definitely knows the game, too. So, 
He's going to become a hitting coach. Watch. Probably. Guaranteed. Uh, you know, well, like Gibson, the way he sees the ball. You know, he G- knows. Gibson did. Uh, Bonds, Bonds is a hitting did, coach. Yeah, he just you know? got fired this year. Um, I mean, you look at the, some of the best hitters of all time did try and go back and do that. So. Um, I wonder though if that's always a good idea because sometimes you can't teach that. Well, I was going to say you. We come up. We've talked about this before. How the best players don't always make the best coaches. Yeah. You know, some guys are just so natural at what they do that they really don't understand the technicality of it. You know, baseball is no different than anything else we do. There's a technicality to it that comes with it. And sometimes you're natural at being technically sound. Sometimes you're just so athletic, you don't have to be as technically sound. Um, but the true great hitters, in my opinion, they, they were technical about what they did. They knew how to go after a curveball. They knew how to, how to go after a slider. They knew how to hit the high and tight. They knew how to hit each pitch, and they could teach what they were doing because they understood it. They could break it down. That's what makes the coach. But then again, when you stop and look at people, to me, Bonds is one of the few guys. I know what he did late in his career, but many people don't remember him in Pittsburgh. You know, um, the guy was a legit hitter. You know, he could hit that ball. Um, Ichiro is going to be another one. The, the, he's not going to be remembered and revered because he didn't hit the long ball. But the way that guy sell the ball, it was just unreal. Being able to get the bat on it, no matter where it was, when he needed to. You know, so. Again, we don't know. The best players don't always make the best coaches, but, I mean, if he understood what he was doing, you know, which I think he did. Yeah. If he understood what he was doing, he'll make a hell of a hitting coach, you know, because um, he is respected, too. I think Bonds', Bonds failure is going to be that I don't think there was a lot of respect for him. You know, I think people are going to say, well, you were on the juice. What, how, yeah. you know, what would you have done without the juice? There's going to be that little question mark in the back, so he'll have a, there'll be a little lack of respect for him as a hitter, you know. But, again, it's always, it's always going to come down to the want of the player. Or the coach in that instance. So, On a lighter note, but no less intense, Raiders come through again this weekend. <laughs> Beat so, the Chargers. So I got a bet with a guy at work. I was telling my brother about this. And he he's tapping me on the shoulder while we're over there in Dallas. And he's like, look at the Raiders, look at the Raiders. I was like, dude, I got 100 bucks on them going 10-6. and six, And they're 4-1. and one. I go, two of those games they probably shouldn't have won. But they did. And I told my brother, I said, this is what I saw at the beginning of the season. They were going to have to prove they could win the games where things didn't necessarily go their way all the way. They've done that twice, once in New Orleans and once yesterday or Sunday against the Chargers. Mm. The good teams find a way to win those games. That's the difference between the good teams and the okay teams. The okay teams, those are coin flips. The good teams, they, they knuckle down and they say, we're going to win this game. We're going to come through. Um, but Cooper, you know, finally that big game, you know, they knew he could do it. And Crabtree still had a touchdown. I told you, you I know? wasn't worried. <laughs> I told you. I told uh, you a lot of people were jumping chip on Cooper, saying, "Now nah, he's probably just a number two. And I was like, I left him in my starting lineup. He gave me some good points. Um, you just hats off to their offense. Uh, they're still bailing out their defense. And that's hopefully at some point their defense finds their feet because they're going to need to down the stretch. I think they can beat Denver twice right now. Mm-hmm. You know, Especially um, after Denver's lost this weekend to Atlanta. Yeah, I, I think, and that was at home, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I didn't think I didn't think Atlanta was a team that could go to, into Denver and beat that defense on the home field, you know. So again, and Denver's going through a carousel right now with Simeon, you know, kind of questionable, and then Paxton Lynch being a rookie. It's going to be kind of tough there. When your quarterback situation is foggy like that, it makes it tougher on the defense because they don't know what they're going to get. You know, they were barely starting to get comfortable with Simeon in there, putting up 10, 12, you know, 17 points, and now Paxton Lynch was in there and they didn't know what they were going to get. You know, when you're not getting points, they're going to start getting frustrated, you know. But, hell, I, I think the West is theirs to lose right now. I definitely do. Um, there's, I haven't looked at the schedule to see what the rest is, but I remember looking at it and saying 10-6 and six was not out of the round enough to where I could bet $100. And, and, and right now, that looks like the smartest bet in the world because I think they get to 7-1 and one before they lose. Really? Yes. I think 7-1 and one is they where they go They got Kansas City next weekend. That, and see, the way that offense has looked and that defense, that's that should be a W for them. They got Kansas City, Jacksonville. Six. The Bucks, Seven. Denver at home. Eight. And then uh, the Texans in Mexico. Nine. So I can see them eight and two when they get to week 11. Um, because I think the... Um, well, I do think they can beat Denver. I think Denver is a coin flip because of the defense. So they're going to have to – that's going to be their defensive test. They shouldn't have – I don't want to say they shouldn't have a problem, but beating Kansas City is definitely not out of the realm. Um, Jacksonville. 
Jacksonville is the one where you're going to go. You which, don't want to lose the one you were supposed to win. Yeah, well, not only that, but you don't know which freaking. Uh, okay, look at the record. Jacksonville team. Look at the record you're facing. Kansas City, two and two. Jacksonville, one and three. Tampa Bay, two and three. Then you get to Denver, who's four and one, mm-hmm. and then Houston, who's three and two. Yeah, sitting right now. You should win technically all five of those games. You should be able. You yes. should be nine and one come that stretch. But again, um, they're learning how to do things. They're a young team, so figuring out, figuring that out is part of their learning curve. The only team right now that they have left on their schedule that's above five hundred as they sit right now is Denver. <laughs> Favorable schedule. Yeah. It always helps with some of those marginal teams. Build Speaking their of uh, the Raiders in Oakland, the meeting that has been set up for Vegas <laughs> for them to talk more on approving them being yeah. with the Vegas. Steve Wynn, the owner of the Wynn Casino, the MGM CEO, and hotel owners in Vegas all spoke highly of wanting to back this project. Hmm. And including the MGM, who is right now the sports mecca in Vegas. Yeah. You know yeah. they have they hold boxing fights yeah. there. They hold all that stuff there. They were all behind it for the fact of tourism. They yeah. they are saying that it could what is now fifty five million people in tourism could be pushed somewhere in the sixty five range. Wow! By tourism and then in room and board yeah. for staying in hotels and stuff like that could be upwards in the seven hundred fifty million dollar range. Wow! So they're all for oh, yeah. the Raiders yeah. coming to Vegas. And if you look at the, the renderings that they've made up, my God, that stadium looks like it'll give you a boner. Walking through Jerryland, which we'll talk more about on Friday because yeah. my brother will be here on Friday. We could talk a little bit more about the trip. But uh, I'll tell you what, man, that stadium, Dallas, being a football fan, you walk through there with a heart on from the time you walk in to the time you walk out. I mean, that place is just, I would say say my heart on because no. – because it's not your team. If you use your heart, I'll have full on uh, rage. I'm, I'm telling you, you're gonna walk in there and you're gonna go, wow. It's, it, it, it destroys every concept you ever had of what a good stadium was. You know, he bared no expense when it came to everything in there. He gave you options to watch it for as cheap as twenty nine dollars, to luxury suites, um, and everything in between. You could buy a ticket for twenty nine dollars and go to the Dr Pepper Lounge or the Miller Light Lounge. And watch the game, and you've got a decent field level. I mean, albeit it's not the best because you're up a little bit, but you can see the field even better. Those screens in there, I know we look at them on TV and you go, "Man, those are some big ass screens," and they give you the dimensions of them. But till you actually get in that stadium and, and see you them. see them, holy shit, dude! I could not describe it to you. I mean, I could show you pictures that I have. I could not describe accurately how big that fucking screen is. It's huge. One on each side, and then, and one, then on the one on the end zone yeah. sides. So, nobody, because we've uh, you've been to football games. Mm-hmm. I've been to San Diego. I've been to Candlestick. I've been to uh, Oakland. You only you can only see the screen from one side of the stadium. So if you happen to be under the screen and you don't have a good view of the field, you're kind of fucked. You're not yeah. going to really see the game. You know, there is not anywhere in that stadium where you cannot see the game. If you're not on the front row on the upper level, because the, the standing tickets is what they are that are twenty nine bucks. If you're not there and you had to sit back. Like maybe, you know, not want to say towards the entrance, but, you know, 10, 15 yards back, you still have a bomb-ass view of one of those big-ass screens. So they did a hell of a fucking job designing it, one, for the fan to be able to see the game from anywhere. All the anonymities in there, holy shit, dude. What do you want? What do you want? You know, the only thing I wasn't fond of, the Apostor Tacos over there, three for three for 20 bucks. Oh, 20 bucks for three. I wasn't going to try. I was going to I wasn't going to validate their uh, authenticity for that price, you know. And then I know why they're there, but they're Miller Lite server only. I never drank Miller Lite before. I probably never will again unless I'm there because it's just water. Yeah, you know it's water, and you know you're you're over there to drink and have a good time. There's no way you're gonna you're gonna spend eight fifty a beer. You're gonna spend some money if you're trying to get drunk, yeah, or even get a buzz on Miller Lite. So you drink before you go in. You know you get in there, maybe you spend thirty bucks on a couple of beers, and then you move on with life. But um, yeah, I'll save most of that for for Friday when yeah. we're at the show. But again, uh, you if you're not a cowboy fan, and unless you absolutely hate the Cowboys and you don't want nothing to do with them this is definitely a trip you want to take because it is an experience we did take the tour um they get to well it's a well uh it's well organized tour they they give you pieces of the stadium all around you don't miss anything you get the cheerleaders so locker room you get you, the players locker room 
how many pervs are in there using their dick beaters in the, the cheer um, room? I don't even want to think about that. Anyway, um, you had told me that the tour ran late, so you guys didn't get to meet any players. Yeah, how does that so, happen? Well, I guess they were running behind or something because the tours, I, what I'm guessing is the ones that were in the front were going slower. Mm. And by the time we rotated through the, uh, the cheerleaders, because you go through the cheerleaders locker room and then you go to the players locker room. When we got to the How close are room, they to each other? Who's that? Uh, I don't want to say not real close. Probably about twenty yards apart. Close enough to get your dick. Uh, right. if, if you're a player, if that's what you're. If you're a player, if that's what you're after, yeah, I'm sure. Mm. You know, so you go through their locker room and then you walk down the hall and then you go into the player locker room. And uh, when we got to the cheerleader locker room, the cheerleaders, there were three of them in there. They had just left. I was like, oh, that sucks. You know. You were trying to catch and them changing. Then, uh, <laughs> well, they were in there talking to the tour people. Yeah. So. And then we get to the other one, and the players had just left because they were loading the equipment mm. into the lockers. I was like, this sucks, you know? I was like, that, uh, whatever. So it, it kind of... Did your brother go up to Dez's locker, throw up the X one time for a picture? No, actually, he, was, he wanted to stand next to Romo's locker and do a thumbs down thing. So <laughs> he's got a picture. I'll tell him to send me that picture so we can put it up. But it's funny. Um, when we got, by the time, okay, so here's the deal. When you get to the locker rooms... As long as they're not putting up the equipment, they'll actually let you walk next to the lockers, you know, because there's nothing in there yet, yeah. and they just you can't you know, swipe. They nothing. tell you don't stand up on the locker or don't sit down on them because if they break, you're responsible. Yeah. So you can go and take pictures right next to the lockers. Well, by the time we had got in there, because we were running late, they were loading shuffling. Equipment. They were, yeah, they were putting shoulder pads and shoes. Mark Sanchez. Yeah. Probably will never see that field this year. How many pairs of shoes does that guy have in his locker? At least six. Six. Yep. Six for a third string quarterback. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I thought that was amazing. So yeah, we saw Witten's locker, uh, Beasley's. You know, we did see Bryant's. Um, Romo's was empty. You know, he's not expected to play. A lot like him on the inside right now. So here's here's something that that's funny. Um, in that locker room, they have the offense and defense separated. Mm -hmm. Offense on one side, defense separate. And I'm like, you preach team unity. You that's preach not uncommon this, though. I know it's not. That's what's funny though. But I've never been in, in a locker room like that where actually you saw it. You hear about it, but you think, oh, that's bullshit. Because like when they're doing interviews, if you're watching the locker room interviews on like NFL Network, you'll see a defensive player and an offensive player next to each other. Maybe it's just because they're BSing or what. But you'll see them intermingle. When you walk into this locker room, there looks to be a legit. Okay, so you got the offense on one side, then you got the O lineman, and then you got the defense. So it's like. The old linemen are actually the barrier between, you know, the the offense and defense. It's funny, but I thought that was a trip. It's like you legitimately one side, and this isn't no small room. You can imagine, okay? The the locker room is probably about the size of my house and my yard together. Yeah. Right. So right in the middle are, are the the nine linemen lockers, and then there's a little space, and then there's all the defense that side, and then the other way, and then there's a. Uh, space and then all the offensive players. So they're legitimately separated. So if Romo wanted to yell something to Claiborne, he'd have to yell it. Yeah. He couldn't say, hey, boy, what? You know, he's got to, hey, he's, he's got to let out a yell. So I, I just thought that was funny. You know, That's done intentionally, though, I think, because you want those groups to play together and to be as close as possible. Yes, team unity is important, but when you're next to somebody every day, if you're a lineman, you want to make them, if you're, you know, management, you want them to be as close as possible. Well, I, yeah, so I you want them that. like that. And you want them to have, if anybody's going to have your back, you don't necessarily want, what well, you do, I mean, in the sense of like, if, you know, a scrum happens and, you know, Ezekiel Elliott gets pushed, you damn sure want, you know, Sean Lee running up to help him. Yeah. But you want one of the linemen to step in their face and be like, I don't think so. That guy's ours. Yeah. You know? And I think that <clears throat> that has a lot to do with it. So Speaking of getting chumped, uh, my, my boys got rolled this weekend. Yes, they uh, did. Was... I want to say I almost let you have it with both barrels because I rolled with Andy Dalton thinking like, oh, hey, their secondary is not great. Like They're going to get some points, and A.J. Green's been this big monster. This ain't the week for him to fall off. Uh, well, he did. Um, luckily, LaFell... Picked up, up some slack, but you're not going to win when LaFell's got two, both of your touchdowns. Um, hey, I didn't care as long as Andy Dalton threw it, <laughs> and he did. So we are uh, we walk in. Uh, we stayed at the tailgate party till 2.30, and then we walked over because it was across the street. We walked over, went to our seats. And How is like, the traffic in and out there, like foot traffic? 
It wasn't terrible. I mean, it's a lot because um, of every stadium. Every stadium, you know, if you're coming out of a game, there's a lot of people coming. Yeah, you know, the way it has to funnel. The parking out. structured is pretty good. You know, there's not. They're pretty. I don't want to say open. Maybe separated is a better word. Each parking se- parking section is a little separated, so it's not like Oakland where it's just condensed into like one area. You know, because Oakland is tough to get out of if you're in the middle or in the back of the yeah. crowd. If you're in the front, you can kind of weasel your way out of there. Once you get stuck in the middle, you're done. This place, it looked like. If you're, you know, people, it's not uncommon for people to park two or three blocks away. Mm. So, and then walk over there. So it it was pretty decent. Um, So we get in and uh, I told my brother, I was like, I can see this bullshit coming. He goes, what? I go, they're not stacking the box. He goes, what do you mean stacking the box? I go, there's six in the box. They need to have eight. He goes, well, why would you want eight? Then it's going to leave the receivers open. I go, no, 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 no. This team is Ezekiel, Ezekiel Elliott. This is his He's the bird. NFL's this leading is his rusher. baby right now. Yep. If you don't stop him first, you ain't going to get nowhere. Yep. Well, sure enough, Cincinnati let him run a fucking muck, you know? And pissed me off because, I, one, I was right, and two, come on, if I know that and I'm the armchair quarterback, how the fuck did they not know they needed to stop him first? It was almost like they were too smart for their own damn good, you know? And... Uh, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, I'm watching, and then A.J. Green doesn't get a target till midway through the second quarter, you know. Um, I wasn't against Gio Bernard starting because it was obvious that he was going to be able to, he had, more, I don't want to say more room, but he was able to shift through that defense more. They just seemed to not be able to play off of that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a big fan of Zampezi as an offensive coordinator, um, and he's proving more and more, and maybe it's Marvin, I don't know, but within that organization, they seem to be fighting and I mean hand over fist the three losses we have you got to look at AJ's numbers they're just ridiculously low I'm sorry but I'm pretty sure in Atlanta they don't walk in and go okay man this team's gonna game plan against Julio we got to go the other way they might say yeah they're gonna say you know what Julio's got to get his touches we're gonna game plan around them covering Julio but you need to look and get him involved if you can yeah you know you find ways to get the ball in his hand he didn't have as big a day as he did last week. You know, you're not, how are you? But if you look and watch Atlanta, they're still trying to get him the ball. They weren't even trying to do that with AJ until they were down. And it's almost like you go, well, we have to get AJ the ball now. We've got to get back in the game. I'm sorry. We don't have much of a running game right now. They need to come out and understand that AJ is the offense right now. I'm sorry. Marvin doesn't like superstars, but that's what AJ is. And AJ is the function of that offense right now. If he is not involved in the game early, there's no way we're going to stay in games. You got to throw that guy the ball on a little bubble screen or just with one step back, chuck it to him, let him make the first guy miss, and then pick up 15 or 20 yards. You know, he'll start creating space for everybody else. I know that it starts and ends with the run game, and eventually you got to have one, but holy shit, these guys are just letting AJ slip away in the losses, and in the wins, he looks like a superstar. Let him be the superstar he's supposed to be. I'm sure Andy will appreciate it too, you know? It'll open up for everybody else. Marvin, and, uh, Marvin Jones and Sanu. Mohamed Sanu did not come in and uh, have to start getting involved. They played off of what AJ did. You know, I mean, you're you're seeing what a good receiver Marvin Jones really was over in Detroit now, but still, AJ Green created for other people. If you get him involved, they have to roll. That safety they were playing over the top of him, he wasn't even his side. He was shaded to that side, you know. So they weren't calling routes to try to get him open. They weren't trying to get him the ball, and that's, oh, God. And then, the, like I said, the defense, just ridiculous. But um, it was fun. Uh, the fans were pretty good. You know, they weren't shitheads. Hecklers, but not shitheads. And I can, appre- good, I can appreciate yeah. heckling. You know, it, it's it's part of the game as a fan. And, and you, if you understand that, you don't get pissed off. So, um, okay, so we'll, we'll talk more about that on Friday. Yeah. A uh, couple other things. NBA news. Last year... We went to the Celtics Kings game. Yes, at Sleep Train. Mm-hmm. Sleep Train is no longer the arena of the Sacramento Kings. They now have the Golden One Center, which is their brand new arena downtown. It really? opened up last night. Oh for wow! The first time. So hmm. that that's some new stuff. What uh, are they uh, doing with Sleep Train? Are they going to demo it? I don't know, uh, because a lot of people still use that arena, like yeah. for concerts oh, and okay. stuff like that. Uh, so I'm not real sure. Um, the other thing, your boy, Mr. Villain himself, who Sit there Friday afternoon and said, I'm okay. I'm coming back. I'll be there to play golf paired with Phil Mickelson. And then Monday, three days. Waited three days and wait, you know what? My vagina hurts. I'm not ready. <laughs> I didn't even see his explanation for not being in there. Said his game's too vulnerable was the quote. That physically he's okay, 
but his game is too vulnerable to compete with professionals. Wow. That was the quote, word for word. Man, that is just crazy. I'm uh I'm a little leery. We've talked about this, you know, somebody tell Tiger I can help him. His game won't be vulnerable if I'm over if I'm coaching him. Um, I'll be a swing coach. We'll we'll win those last couple of majors you need, and we'll move on with life. You know, I'll take a little. I just want to know: Would you bring pussy with you to practice? <laughs> That's what I want. Here, here's the funny part about that: as a coach, you you look for, and you know this, you look for what it takes to get a player motivated. Mm-hmm. Some players are motivated by the yelling. Some are motivated by the subtle talk. You you find what you need to motivate the uh, the player. Without bringing the player grief it, with it in a from a personal point of view, because as a coach we do have to take into consideration that I mean, albeit we deal with kids, but we're not going to tell a kid to go out there and be a monster if we think it's going to create a monster off the court. Right. You know, we got to teach them. You can be a monster here, but when you cross back across that baseline and you're going home, that monster needs to stay here. Yeah. You know, you can put that suit back on when you get back. We have to teach them that delicate balance. Well, on a professional level. As a swing coach, I think too many times because I love watching uh, uh, golf picks and stuff like that. And a lot of times, if you listen to the way they're with the swing coaches when they have uh, like Mickelson's when he's there or, or Fowler's, they're, they're teaching them from a technical aspect. They're not involved in anything other than the golf game, which I think is sad because Tiger needed someone who I don't want to say knows his golf game because. Let's just face it. There isn't anybody that knows golf like Tiger. Right. So you're not going to teach Tiger something he doesn't already know. You're what about there... Tiger's goatee? <laughs> not on point? No. <laughs> you're there to teach Tiger how to manage golf and life. So you've got to help him find that balance. When you help him find that balance, which is what Harmon did with him real good, he's going to win. His head's clear. He's going to win. Now, whether Harmon was contributing to the pie factor that he was getting all the time, I don't know. We'll never know because neither one of them are going to drop a dime on each other. Right. But unless you find a voicemail that says, "Hey, this yeah. is Tiger, get it over here now." Make sure she's here. Yeah, and she doesn't have a cell phone, <laughs> um, or at least an answering machine. <laughs> so whatever Harmon was doing was working with Woods because that's when he was winning. You know, um, do you take it to him? I don't know. I guess as long as you think it's not. I mean, morally, to me, uh, if you're if you're not married and that's what you need, I think it's it's your prerogative to go out and do that if that's what you want. You know, it's your decision. But like uh, Bobby Brown, as your prerogative. As, yeah, but it doesn't come down to. Um, it shouldn't come down to where, yes, I need it or no, I don't. It shouldn't affect your play because you're supposed to be able to separate those two, and it's evident he couldn't. You know, one was directly. We're, we're learning that his his attitude and behavior outside the golf course directly affected what happened on the golf course. Mm-hmm. And don't get me wrong, I know what a delicate balance that is. I've struggled with it myself. You know who else is facing that same issue? What's that? John Jones. Yeah. The connection yeah. of what happens outside, outside of the octagon yeah. directly affects how well, things yeah. happen inside the octagon. So, I could fix him. I'll help you. <laughs> get it out to Tiger if you're listening. Tell him I'll help him with this. We can, we can get through this. Threesomes, cocaine, and all. Uh, you know what? Sometimes his coach has got to jump on the grenade. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I saw that withdrawal. I told my brother we were in breakfast yesterday. I go, look at this bullshit. He's like, what? I go, you Tiger, he pulled out already. He goes, uh-huh. no, he's playing. I saw it. I said, look, this is five minutes ago on Sports Center, and he's like, you know what they said, right? No, I'll that he you. pulls out more of tournaments than he does of women. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. He's, he's only got two kids. We don't have no paternity. <laughs> that don't mean nothing. You don't have paternity. That don't totally mean nothing. <laughs> you and I both know that don't mean nothing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did see that. That's kind of disappointing. But anyways, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Uh, did you see Conor McGregor's fine? I did not. He got so. The, you remember how him and Nate Diaz got <clears throat> yeah busted for throwing shit? At oh, the and the Nevada the, the, the athletic the, commission. He, he had his uh, hearing yesterday. He didn't have to be present, but they had the hearing yesterday. Yeah, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for throwing water and fifty hours of community service. That was a Nevada court. That's Nevada Athletic State Commission. Here's wow. what's better. Somebody tweeted this out yesterday, and I saw this online. In the state of Nevada, a domestic battery one, the fine is a thousand dollars, and no community service. And he's paying one hundred fifty thousand dollars and doing fifty for throwing water bottles. Wow! Now, I if you have the the UFC Fight Pass, the hearing was on. They put it on Fight Pass. Did they? So I was talking to one of the guys that I see at work all the time. We were talking about 
so the Biz being Henderson fight. Yeah. And we I went to go look at the app to like look at like who the whole card was. Yeah. And all of a sudden like it was across the bottom like live now like and so I touched it. The guy who was like the the I guess you would consider him like the prosecuting lawyer mm-hmm. in the case. He was like, we're going to look at, like, exhibit A, B, and, like, they had, like, five different examples, and, like, one of them was four YouTube videos of them during the press conference throwing the cans and the bottles. So, I was like, wow. So, Diaz, his hearing has been pushed back a little bit, but he's still going to do his, and then John Jones and Brock Lesnar's uh, hearings for their doping issue have both been pushed back as well. Wow. So, Connor got his done. He got his out of the way. Uh, The tweet from Connor. I get fined more than you bums make. <laughs> wow. So, well, <laughs> uh, and then Connor's there's reports that yesterday Connor was sparring and got knocked out and possibly broke his nose. Oh, no way. And if he breaks his nose and gets a concussion from the knockout, that puts 205 in jeopardy cuz that's a month yeah, away. I was going to say that's pretty close. Even so, a, even just a broken nose. John Cavanaugh tweeted who's his head coach. Tweeted, don't always believe what you read on the internet. It's some of it's bullshit. And he put like a picture from the movie Signs, like the the foil helmet. Oh, yeah. He put a picture on there of him with a foil helmet on there, like all stupid. And at the bottom it says, I want to believe. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Crazy. So I don't know. I'm sure he got, he probably got dropped in sparring, but I don't know if he got knocked out. Knocked out, broken um, nose and all that. So... Because he tweeted directly about the fine, but he didn't say anything about reports of, of him sparring. Getting, so that's, ha, that's crazy. Uh, it was it was definitely interesting. Um, UFC two hundred four was this last weekend. Bisping B Tando. I heard it was mad questionable. Well, I tell you what, a lot of the uh, posts I was looking at and the tweets that were coming back, they were putting up uh, pictures of Bisping. He certainly looked like he took his the worst eye was of it, yeah. almost closed. He looked completely. like he took the worst of it. I haven't seen it. The um, cut looked so nasty yeah, on his oh, cheek. Man. The sec- look, did you see the second day pictures? Yeah, Those look even where it was worse. stitched yeah. and it was closed up oh, completely. Man, that yeah. look ugly. His left eye. Um, yeah. For all intents and purposes, from the way that I heard the fight went down, because I still got to watch it back, the way that I heard the fight went down, it was similar to the McGregor Diaz fight in that there, that Hindo dropped him a few times, mm-hmm. and then Biz being through combinations. Like leg kicks and was more active, mm-hmm. and that they scored the card for Biz being as if Hindo's knockdowns Didn't weren't count. enough. Hmm. Um, and a lot of people had those knockdown rounds as Hindo's, and then they said he won in the in one of the later rounds. That was, was it enough. a split decision? Yeah. Oh wow. So um, it was interesting uh, to see, and they said that like a lot of people. Uh, feel that the judges fucked up that on one of the rounds where he dropped him like twice that he almost finished him that the round should have been a 10-8 wow and that Hendo didn't get it but they were in Manchester and Bisping's yeah. undefeated in England yeah there, so, there's a reason for it <laughs> so like people like some of the other fighters were tweeting like Hendo gets robbed of going out with a storybook ending a couple people tweeted that's why I never want to fight Bisping in England <laughs> like there's some stuff wow. coming out there uh, Gegar Musasi knocks the fuck out of Vitor Belfort to the point that Vitor says, I don't know if I want to fight anymore. Oh, wow. Um, and that kid's, I mean, he's in there, you know. Uh, and he had a nice press conference afterwards where he used his press conference time <laughs> wisely saying that people are stupid. That uh, you had great guys that used to fight like Ali and these boxers that talked about being the greatest and their skills and everything else. And he goes, now you have jackasses like Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor who say I have money and people are paying to see those idiots. <laughs> so it was a, like he's definitely using his time in front of the camera and in front of the microphone wisely to wow. get people talking about him. Nice. Uh, now didn't uh, did Cerrone fight on this one? Or he's no, on he's on two hundred five. Okay, that's right. Uh, Stefan Struve, the heavyweight, won by a, a Darcy choke. Uh-huh. Which is is only the second Darcy choke Ever. in heavyweight history, <laughs> so that was it was interesting. He's on his way back up. He had some issues, but he's on his way. So back the Frankie up. Edgar fight that's on two hundred five. Yes. Too. Okay. Uh, November twelfth, it will be. He's on the undercard, wow. like the the, the Fox Sports one, one Fox prelims. <laughs> uh, he's fighting Jeremy Stevens. <laughs> yeah. Cerrone's fighting Calvin Gastelum. Um, you got Weidman, Joel Romero. Yeah. You got. Uh, John, uh, Joanna Javicek versus Carolina something. She's 10 and 0 for the strawweight women's title. You got Woodley versus Wonderboy. Yeah. You got um, 
Who else is on there? Uh, Raquel Pennington, Misha Tate. I mean, this card is literally, like, on paper, the greatest card that the UFC's ever put together, period. Hmm. Uh, Tim Kennedy, Rashad Evans is wow. on that card. And then, of course, the main event, Conor McGregor versus yeah. Eddie Alvarez. Now, um, th- something that was tweeted from Tim Kennedy was interesting. Okay, if, Do you know who Tim Kennedy is? No. Okay, so Tim Kennedy is an ex like special forces guy. Okay. And he's got like he always posts video of him shooting shit and like he he's the guy, I don't know if I'm sure you've read headlines. Tim Kennedy says, I'll I'll tweet out my address, ISIS come find me, I'm ready to kill okay. you motherfuckers. Yeah. That's Tim Kennedy. Okay. <laughs> and he always posts videos like he'll do uh shooting demos on Instagram where he'll put one arm across like as if like a hand across his chest, almost like he's saluting with the, the wrong hand, and then go through Fire a, a gun with one bullet in the like in it like not in the chamber in the clip where he has to use his body, bang it in, set it with the slide, mm-hmm. shoot it, and then reload it with one hand, and he does shit like that wow. all the time. And this guy's a freak, dude. And he always posts videos like, "ISIS, you're not. We're not afraid of you. Me and my friends are ready to fucking tear each and every one of your heads off." Like <laughs> he's one of those dudes that is down for the cause, right? Wow. Well. He tweeted that uh, uh, the whole thing about what they have to do. Hold on. Okay. Um, the he tweeted about what the cost is for the medical for uh, two hundred five. What they're asking them to do. Check this out, right? I'm gonna pull this up for you real quick. This and this has to be paid out of the fighter's pocket. This isn't the UFC going, hey, we need you to come over here and do all these tests. We got you covered. This is the UFC going, hey, if you're fighting here, this is what it costs. So this is what he tweeted as far as what the UFC is requiring. And I don't know if it's just straight up uh, from New York and it's only New York that's asking all these things or if this is a regular Mm -hmm. thing. So this, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm waiting for it to load up here. Uh, the thing that he said, one of them was uh, an EKG. Okay. Was one of them. Uh, it said new blood work. Um, and uh, where is it? At? There it is. Had to find it on Sure Dog here. It actually has the picture. Uh, oh, okay. Here we go. New blood work must be CBC, HIV, Hep B. Uh, antigen, Hep C antibody, PT, PTT, INR, comprehensive over 35 panel, including electrolytes, creatine, and liver function. That's just the blood work. Okay. Number two, urine analysis. Okay. Three, new physical exam. Must be done by medical doctor and due on attached New York medical form. Exams done by nurse practic- practitioners or physician's assistant will not be accepted. Hmm. EKG 12 lead, please send in EKG graph. Chest x-rays, please send with doctor's report. New eye exam must be done by, oh, I can't even pronounce this, but it says on attached eye form. Exams done by optometrist will not be accepted. So it must be like an eye doctor, yeah. like not an optometrist. <clears throat> MRI brain scan, please attach requirement and regulations with guide. Please send radiologist dictations, for exam. Cornerman and training applications. All cornermen must complete application and return to me ASAP along with current photo ID. That's everything that they have to go through medically. You know how much this costs? How much? Almost 10 grand. Really? And it's got to come out of their pocket? Their pocket. So if you're a guy on the lower end that only makes 10 for the walk and 10 for a win, you lose half your money in medical. <laughs> how does that make sense? That's the UFC making money. Floyd Mayweather comes out because Connor is fighting Eddie Alvarez. Yeah. Dana says, Connor beats Eddie Alvarez at 155. Floyd, give me a call. We'll set it something up if he wins this fight. So apparently if he wins this fight, suddenly he's a big enough star to make this happen with Floyd Mayweather, right? Mm. Mayweather has already said, the only way I'm fighting him is under boxing rules. It's under my terms, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Dana White says, nope, we'll fight. We'll make it happen if he beats Eddie Alvarez. And there will be kicks, there will be elbows, and there will be punches. Mayweather will never agree and with he, that. And Mayweather goes, that's the problem right there. Dana White is just trying to scam money off the UFC. Straight up puts him on blast wow. and goes on to say things about why Dana White is making 
himself and the, the head people in charge rich off of these guys who are legitimate athletes. And he gave credit to the UFC fighters. He goes, that's what's different about boxing. Boxing, our fighters get fair pay. The UFC screws their fighters. From the mouth of Floyd Mr. Man. Money himself. <laughs> I thought that was interesting that like he came forward and said that. Like, I was like, damn. Like, so it was one of those things where it's interesting to hear. And this card's huge. Yeah. You know, this card's going to be huge. And then you hear this. And now Goldman Sachs, who is one of the big firms that was a part of the group that bought the UFC for $4 yeah. billion. Dollars, apparently, there's reports coming out that there was uh, exaggerated documentation of finances from the UFC and that Goldman Sachs was warned to not partake in the buying of the company. Really? So, it's interesting. Now all this stuff's coming out about financials. Hmm. It could be hard to think that the, that the UFC entity itself was not worth that money. Now, you do know that they now have celebrity investors as well. Yes. Because they're one of the, the companies that was a part of that group represents celebrities, athletes, actors and such. They now have several people who have stakes in the company. Yeah. Tom Brady, Conan O'Brien, they have several names that are big name people mm -hmm. that now are considered investors in, in the UFC. company. So interesting to hear a lot of this stuff come out. Sad to hear that they got to spend half their finances on this shit. I mean, that's that's pretty sad. Yeah. That you're asking a guy to to spend half of his money and if he loses, check this out. If you're one of those lower guys and you lose, you just lost all your money in yeah. medical. You just fought for nothing. Yeah. You literally fought for free. And that's not counting oh, man. That's not counting money to eat while you're in New York. That's not counting oh, hotels. hotels and stuff that's like. not counting flights. Like, Because yeah. the UFC has openly said that, uh, <clears throat> and fighters have said, they'll cover my flight and one. That's it. So if you're bringing your wife or your girlfriend, that's your one. What about everybody that's in, in your corner? In your corner, yeah. You know, you like, gotta pay everybody in your corner too. I mean, wow, that's yeah, just crazy. So it, it's really a mess, and uh, so it was one of those things that <clears throat> that uh, they they were talking about quite a bit lately with everything going on and, and how big that card is because that's that's the next card coming yeah. up. It'll be uh, it'll be interesting for sure. Um, so yeah, that uh, that's the UFC news for this week. So, uh, back to football. Tom Brady's triumphant return. Yeah. I was watching um, NFL, no, well, I think it was on NFL Network on Sunday morning. Or no, it was Saturday. Uh, we were watching it before we took off to the tour. And uh, they had a picture of Tom Brady. And uh, I forget who one of the, the announcers, he's like, how would you like to play this pissed off guy today? And the guy throws for 406 and three touchdowns and says, ah, I still had some rust. Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? What did you see? If I were you, I'd be afraid next week. I, you, I don't even want to watch the because, game. I because mean, who does he play next week? He plays the Cincinnati Bengals at home in Foxborough. Here's the one thing I do like uh, sometimes about Cincinnati's lack of uh, coaching these days. They're not smart enough to know they should be in trouble right now. They should feel like they're in trouble. Um they are going to prepare like they would for anybody else. They'll go through the motions of preparing. Um, and even during interviews, you're going to hear them say, um, yeah, it's Tom Brady. We know he's we know he's great, and we're going to prepare like we do every week. Uh, it's that's another, norm, another normal week of preparation for a good QB with a lot of weapons. That's what they're going to – that's the one thing that Marvin Lewis does do. He doesn't put anybody on a pedestal and, and say, yeah, this is a good team. He's going to say, we're going to prep for the New England Patriots and Tom Brady at quarterback. And – we're going to try to do this and this, and that's that's it, you know. So a lot of the big wins in Marvin Lewis's uh, tenure there have come at times where people didn't think they had a chance, but because of the way they prepare, you know, there's really – he doesn't put it in their player's mind that we're playing a superior team, which they are by in every facet, you know. Um, Brady – me and my brother were talking about it. Brady's on a mission right now to prove to the NFL, one, uh, I'm still the greatest here, and two, fuck you guys, <laughs> you know. Um, he's gonna he's gonna shred it pretty much everybody he sees the rest of the way in. Everybody was hoping for New England to go zero and four while he was gone. That didn't happen. One and three. That didn't happen. Two and two. That didn't happen. Guess what? They came out of that break three and one, and Brady's back now. Oh shit! You do not want to be in that guy's path. You don't. Um, Gronk got some catches and yards this week. I mean, that team at full strength. 
that's pretty scary. You know, that that's a daunting task for them. Uh, Cincinnati does a good job of shutting down Antonio Brown and Ben Roethlisberger. Maybe shutting down is not the right word. Slowing down. Mm. So I, I'm not going to sit here and say that they can't do it. But I know the last time they played New England, it was in Cincinnati. And Brady had like this freaking, I don't know, 30-something game uh, streak of a touchdown in every game. And Cincinnati broke it and beat them 13-7. to You know, so it's not out of the realm hey, to hey, think hey. that they couldn't. You want to shut down Gronk? Go ahead. You want to shut down any of these no-name receivers like Chris Hogan? <laughs> you go right ahead. But let Martellus Bennett have his yardage. He had three touchdowns his last game, dude. Guess who played it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would, I'll would. i tell you what. We're talking, In the that's... morning games, I had uh, Theo Reddick mm-hmm. and Martellus Bennett. Nice. Just in the morning games. Five touchdowns. Five touchdowns yeah. to start the day. Oh, it was a good way yeah. to start. Yeah. And Martellus Bennett's proving to be the Aaron Hernandez over there, you know? Without killing somebody. Well, not yet, anyways. We'll wait till he gets paid. We'll see what happens. Hey, Black Lives Matter. Don't do <laughs> he, uh Yeah, he's being the beast over there. And I think everybody knew he would. Everybody Speaking knew of that. I had a, a bit of a little bit of a discussion, a, a, a healthy discussion, okay. with uh, the girlfriend's friends about Colin Kaepernick, because there were some four diehard 49er fans there, okay. and they were talking about how, uh, you know, how it's so cool that he's like got this movement going and like all this stuff, and I said, really? I said, so Colin Kaepernick's a hero. And they went, well, I, yeah, kind of. I mean, not like hero in the sense of like, <laughs> I said, they said not hero in the sense of, you know, like, oh, he's fought like and like done yeah. something heroic, but like he's got this conversation going and it's a good thing that he spotlighted this. I said, so you're telling me that the only way he could have used his platform that he has as a professional athlete to get people talking about this is to take a knee during the national anthem. And they went. Well, no, he you know he's donated jersey sales to the cause, and then I said, okay, so what's the difference in him taking a knee and flipping people off that carry that flag out there? Because it's still going to draw attention, yeah. and if he says this is why I'm doing it, people are now aware of the cause. What's the difference? There's no answer. <laughs> and I said, you want to know what this is? This is disrespectful. And they went, no, 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 he is not disrespecting like veterans and stuff like that. I said, yes, he is. Well, he's had conversations with it. I said, hey, you're right. He has had conversations with military vets that have said, like, hey, we, it's fine, you know. Yeah. But what I want people to understand is, is I know uh, a handful of people that have been in the military or, or, you know, are in the military, and they will all tell you the same thing, that when they're the ones fighting, they are patriotic. But when people talk about their rights and all that shit, you will – it is rare. I'm not going to say never. It is rare to hear, hear whether you're a Marine, an Army, Air Force, whatever, Navy. It is rare to hear them say, those people are fucking disrespectful. What you generally hear is, that's why I do what I do. Yeah. So they can do those things. It is rare to hear somebody do that as a military person to stand up against somebody who's using their rights. Because that's what these guys yeah. have chosen to do is to defend that. Yeah. And to go out foreign and domestic against anybody who's willing to try and take that away. So you're not going to get a whole lot of resistance from people that are selfless like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people misunderstand that yeah, and definitely. thinking that like, no, look, they're on his side. No, not necessarily. They want awareness to the subject too, I'm sure. Yeah. But they're not going to stand there and go, hey, fuck you too, buddy. You know what we do for you? No. They're looking at us going, we fight so he can do that. Yeah. Well... This is where it got dicey, where it got a little more intense during the discussion because they said, well, he donated, you know, so X amount of dollars to people that uh, were, uh, you know, behind this issue. I said, okay, so let me ask you something. Somebody who's a professional athlete, we see professional athletes make appearances at clubs and bars and movie premieres and all this other stuff, award shows, and they get dressed up and do this fancy shit, right? And they're like, yeah. I said, so tell me when Colin Kaepernick doesn't have time to go to speak as a motivational speaker on these topics to crowds that are either with him or to help persuade people to have this conversation. Not change their mind, but to have this conversation on this topic that he feels so strongly about. Suddenly the hush fell over the crowd. (laughs) I said, that's my problem. You put Colin Kaepernick on the cover of Time Magazine and say that it's a courageous act of taking a knee. I'm sorry, you are pissing on everybody that has fought for that flag and given you the ability to do what you're doing. 
I'm not saying that what he's fighting for is wrong. No, I've said that before. I think it is a good thing to bring light to and have a healthy conversation about. But to sit here and to have people believe that at this point, five weeks into the NFL season, that this guy is doing something courageous and heroic is horseshit. Yeah. It is blatant horseshit. Yep, definitely. You want to stand up and do something? Then stand up when nobody's there. When the cameras aren't on you. Yeah. When you're willing to go away from practice, away from your team, and do that. Yeah. Tell me where that's at. Show me the social media pictures of people taking pictures of Colin Kaepernick at a rally about these things. Yeah. Not when he's only on the field and there's a camera in on his face. On TV, yeah. You know, and I'm not saying that he's aware of the camera in his face, so he does it purposely, but he's aware that it's a nationally televised game. Yeah. So now, oh, this is my platform. I take a knee here. Really? Why don't you talk about it when you, you have time and it's not related to football? Yeah. That's what I want to That's know. when it matters, you know? You look at a lot of these foundations that a lot of the players do do. Um, those are the guys that I have the most respect for because those foundations require work from them outside of the football season, you know? Um, they talk about, uh, well, Carson Palmer's one of the ones, and I'm always, he didn't stay a Bengal, but like one of the good guys in the NFL that's not really talked about. He did a lot when he was in Cincinnati. Uh, when he went to Oakland, he did a lot there. He's doing a lot in Arizona. You know, these guys with these foundations that help, it's not just shedding light. It's an actual action that's making a difference. I don't want to say that what Kaepernick's doing isn't making a difference, but I'm sorry. Where were you before the season started? Because there was a lot of this already going on. Mm -hmm. This has been heated for going on over a year now. Where the fuck were you before the football season? You could have stood up and said, you know what? We need to bring attention to this. I'm going to do. I'm going to bring attention to this any way that I can. And you're proactive. And then when the season starts, you go, you know what? This could be an opportunity to do this now to further put light on it. Then it's a little bit different of a story. But for you to wait for week two in the NFL... To fucking take a knee all It was like week sudden. three of the preseason yeah, start doing I, it. Whenever he started, for you to wait for that moment to be noticed, I'm sorry. I don't I don't buy into it that it means that much to you. When I saw the photo of him in, at practice wearing the pig socks. Yeah. God. That, to me, said more than taking a knee. Yeah. Well, the flag thing, like you said, well, you might not agree. The, the opinion of the disrespect to the flag... That'll be different with everybody you talk to. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's got a different point of view on that. And wh whether or not you believe the country is responsible for, the, uh, for what he's saying is going on, that's one thing. That's a matter of opinion. But for you to fucking blatantly disrespect police officers like that, I'm not going to sit here and try to say every police officer is a fucking saint because we know there are not. There is proof that there are some bad ones out there. All right? But I got news for you. There are also some bad football players out there, too. Mm -hmm. We don't categorize all the football players as shithead junkies that beat their wives just because a few of them are out there doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay? What Kaepernick did with those pig socks is basically put every cop into the same barrel and say they're all bad. I had a bigger problem with that one than I did the flag. Mm -hmm. Because now all of a sudden, um, I have friends that are cops or sheriff deputies or uh, CHP guys. And they're good guys. You're saying that they're the same piece of shit that these guys, that these ones that are out there shooting guys for the wrong reason. Because it's happening. I'm not going to deny it's happening. Yeah. It's happening. But you're putting them in the same fucking barrel. Okay, so with your belief, Mr. Colin Kaepernick, with your stereotype of cops, basically you're the same as Josh Gordon who just checked himself into rehab. You're the same as Ray Rice who slapped his wife across, across the face or knocked her the fuck out. Yeah. You know? You're the same as Alden Smith, a teammate, who was having all of those problems. You are the same guy as those guys. That's what you're saying. Because you're a football player. You're, it's the same thing. All football players are the same. I'm sorry, they're not. I know, I don't want to say I know, but you read about a lot of good football players, guys who make difference. I want to believe they all have some of that in them. But under what he's saying, why wearing those fucking pig socks, he's saying all cops are the same, then all football players are the same. And I'm sorry, but some football players should be taking offense to that. Mm -hmm. They should be saying, hey, wait a minute, don't do that. What you're doing is you're putting them all in the bucket. Would you like to be told you're the same person as Alden Smith? I mean, because right now that guy is one of the ones considered bottom in the barrel. You know, um, there's a lot of talk about Josh Gordon, but the homeboy knew he had a problem. He checked himself in. Touche to him. Not a lot of people can do that. Yeah. It's hard to admit, you know. Uh, Ray Rice still paying for his crime. You know, you're saying that you're no better than them. Uh, you better watch what you're thinking about there, kid. You know, I, I think you're sending two different messages. This, to me, what his message got, it has taken on what we hate about society today. And it's this sense of that every, if, because 
what you say or what you do offends me, you all have to care. Yeah. And that's the problem. Now, not taking away from the people that have lost their lives in these situations and the, the chaos that has become the situation with police and black people that are getting shot, white cops that are involved. That's like saying that the one white cop that shot the black guy, that all white cops are like that. Yeah. And that every black guy that you see on the street is the same as the guy that got shot. And that's not true. Yeah. That's not true at all. Nobody is exactly alike in that regard. Yeah. You may have people that are the similar mind frame, but nobody is exactly the same in that regard. You can't do that. Yeah. But the problem is, is that there's all these groups right now that come out and say, I'm offended. These transgendered people or these I identify people. I have no problem with somebody who wants to be gay. I'm not into Pecker, but if you are, congratulations. Just don't try to hit on me because yeah. I don't go that way. I got, I'll i be friends with you. We can watch a game. We'll drink beers together. Shit, I don't care. I'll even tell you if a guy looks good or not, in my opinion. I'm not going to check him out, but I'll <laughs> tell you if he's a handsome man or not. And I said this last night. I made this joke last night to my girlfriend that if a gay dude, if you find out some guy's gay, I want to know that this gay dude is with the best looking gay dude he can get with. I want them to be as happy as possible and have like a model looking boyfriend yeah. or a model looking <laughs> girlfriend. So that way when they go, yeah, I'm gay, be like, shit, look at him. Like yeah. he's gay and he's working it. Like, yeah. hell yeah. I got no problem with that. You want to be transgendered? I don't always agree with like, the process of what you think is, oh, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa or whatever. I don't necessarily agree with that because you have certain body parts that say otherwise. But I will say this. It is your life, and they are your choices, and it's not my place to say yes or no on yeah. what I think should and shouldn't happen. So if you want to choose to switch that up and get rid of your dick, or you want to get boobs and do that stuff, hey, or take testosterone and grow a beard like mine, have at it, okay? But don't come around me and say, you offend me because you don't agree with me. Don't come to me if you're one of these I identify people when we have these sick motherfuckers out here that all they got to say is, and I heard this on, uh, I think it was like um, one of the podcasts I was listening to. I forget which one it was. But this guy, it might have been uh, Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. uh, his podcast. This guy identifies as like an eight-year-old girl and like wears like pigtails and dresses up like an eight-year-old girl and plays the part. And wants everybody to treat him like an eight-year-old girl. The problem is this guy is 40-some-odd years old. You're going to act like 40 years old of being a man, 40 years of being a man didn't matter? That that didn't exist? That you're an eight-year-old girl at heart? I'm supposed to be sensitive to that. I'm supposed to treat you like a child. I'm supposed to treat you like a little girl. Everybody wants to sit here and go, you have to. Because that's, that's his right. And you have to go here and you have to treat him that way. You're wrong, I don't. I don't have to deal with that person at all. I don't gotta be an asshole to him, but I don't gotta deal with him. Yeah, and they forget that they're they're trying to tell you, you have to do that to him. Well, wait a minute, why do I have to do something? This is his decision. Yeah. Let him behave how one he wants of the to biggest, behave, but don't tell me how yes, I gotta behave. This is one of my biggest problems about the language barrier in this country, specifically this state. My girlfriend is Mexican, like full blown Mexican. Both her parents are Mexican. She's not mixed at all. But I have a problem with families that come in. I used to work for a fast food spot. I used to have a problem when people would come in and did not speak English and they would get mad at us as a company yeah. for not accommodating them. I'm sorry, this country wasn't built on one language in the sense of, oh, Spanish is what it's always been. And so you have to speak Spanish. No, there are companies that do accommodate that. Yeah. But if you don't, and you're somebody who doesn't understand that, then you need to go into that understanding that that's not accommodated and make yeah. the proper adjustment. Don't take it out on the people that don't. Because I got news for you. If I have to work in a fast food spot and somebody comes in and they speak a language, it doesn't have to be Spanish, but they speak a language that I don't understand and none of the people that I'm working with understand, I can't help them. So don't be mad at me because I can't help you. Don't, don't look at me and go, you're uneducated. And you can't help me. Because if I were to go to your country, there's nobody that's going to go, hey, go get Jimmy out of the back. We got a white guy up here. Well, and actually, in a lot of other countries, you do that, and you could get thrown out of restaurants. Yeah. You could, some places, people actually get violent with you if you don't know the native tongue. Yeah. You know, you can put, you can be and in some real unusual situations. It's this sense of, in this society, that 
you have to do and be offended or you you're either with them or, or you're against, against them. them. Yeah. And there's no middle ground, which isn't true. You can sit here and say, "Hey, I'm not the judgmental type. I it's not my call. You want to do that? That's your choice." Yeah. I don't I'm not going to be an asshole to you, but I'm not going to don't be mad at me for not engaging in your situation or not having an opinion on your situation one way or the other. Yeah. You know, and that's the problem with this Colin Kaepernick thing to bring this back around full circle is that He's standing up for an issue he believes in. Kudos to him for doing that. Yeah. There's other people that feel the same way as him, obviously, in the NFL by trying to show this quote-unquote united front that are doing the same thing he's doing. Yeah. Really? If you guys are that united, then why aren't you guys getting together on your own time? Yeah. And as a group, shoot a fucking commercial. Yeah. As a group I'm sure about that. I'm sure you'll find someone. Guaranteed there. somebody yeah. will pull fat money out of their pocket and go, hey, you guys want to talk about this? Yeah. And they're looking for star people to talk about this. Yeah. I promise. Yeah. It's it's all about the almighty dollar. And people will pay you to do that because it will garner people to look, to watch, to be a part of, all that stuff. Because that's the society we live in. It's yeah. technology and TV. Yep. You, it's an ad on YouTube now. It's a commercial on TV now. Guess what? You're seeing it everywhere. And then all of a sudden you're talking about it. I don't see him doing anything that makes you stand up and go, I, I can get behind this because... It's for the right reasons. It's for the right thing. He's going about it in a way that just makes sense. That it just, he's being peaceful about it. He's going about it in the right way. To me, it just seems like he has a, an idea of something he stands up against, but he just wants to stir shit up. Yeah. Well, I'm doing a good job in making people talk about it. Motherfucker, we want to hear you talk about it. Not everybody else. We want to hear you. You're the one standing up here. You wanted to be the poster child. Yeah, you, you want to be child. the dude to take a knee, then be the guy that's willing to stand and take the forefront of it all and go, okay, I'm the guy that said this is a problem and I want to, and that this needs to be talked about. I'll lead the discussion. Yeah. Where's that guy? That's what I want to know. This is why I have a problem. And most 49er fans will sit here and go, why back him up? Because he's on my team. Do you know what the fuck he's standing for? Yeah. Do you know... Whether or not he's actually doing more than just taking a knee on Sundays. That's what I want to know. You yeah. know, five weeks into the NFL season and, and we're still talking about this guy's bullshit. Not the positive spin that he's put on this. Yeah. Not how far we've come in seven weeks that he's been doing this since the preseason. On Look at how much more now we're aware of what's going on. It's still the same bullshit of people being mad about him taking a knee and disrespecting this country and this flag and the people that have given him the ability to do so. That shows you how far he's taken his issue. Mm -hmm. That we're not past the knee. No. And because we're not past the knee, it means that he's not. He doesn't have the right conversations going on mm -hmm. because it, it didn't start conversation. It started conflict. You know, and all he did was create more division. Mm -hmm. You know, your actions in that situation they got to be unifying, not dividing. You know, granted, there were going to be people that didn't agree, but if it's a legit issue, if there's a legit concern, you'd be surprised how many people agree and how few people disagree. And that's basically what I don't think he's taken into account. You know, did I do something to build society or am I one of the knuckleheads tearing it down? And he's tearing it down right now. You know, unite, like you said, you, you got to do more than just take a knee. It, t it needed to be more, and I don't think whoever gave him that idea told him that. In the beginning, I think the knee was the idea of like oh i can i can get them to look at me and since then it's like okay well what's the next step of that yeah and that step hasn't been taken yeah so sure. uh, and that's my problem is it this this overly sensitive society that wants to know about well you should be offended with us you should be sensitive to us no is is the problem that's the problem and how about i saw speaking of all this this topic and shit going off of sports here I saw an article today that says people need to stop bitching about reverse racism. Okay, for those of you who don't understand that listen to this show what reverse racism is, <laughs> that means if you're not a minority, whether in wherever you're yeah. at, that you're not allowed to have complaints or a point of view on racism. Yeah. Because you're considered the majority that that, that you're privileged. Yeah. Whether you're white in America or you're, you know, Whatever in your country, you're what something different that's a majority rather than a minority. You're yeah. not allowed to speak out against things because you're in the majority. Yeah, I. That's where we're at with this. I'm if you're, it's it's legitimately yeah. the if you're not with us, you're against yeah. us. Yeah, and, and that's again, what are you doing? Are you creating unity or are you creating division? You know, 
Uh, one of the best things about this last weekend, um, experienced a little bit. Again, we'll get more into what really what was going on, but um, where we were sitting, I had an older black couple sitting to my right. Um, the the row behind us was all a bunch of white girl cow cowgirl white girls behind us. Um, to my brother's left, there was an older white couple, and then in front of us was some uh, young young Hispanic couples. So. No anger towards each other, no fight. There's one instance, we'll talk about it on Friday because my brother has got to tell, that's, that's yeah. going to be his story to tell. But, um, you know, we did experience a little bit of racism. And what was uniquely funny about the whole situation in general was that uh, my brother is a Cowboys fan. That's why we were there. And I'm a Bengals fan. So that's why we were there watching that game. But we ran across every race over there, you know, from white to Asian and everything in between. And the reason I use Asian as the back is because they're the farthest away. Yeah. Asia is the farthest away from us. You know, there's white people, there's black people, there's Mexican people, there's half white, half black, half Mexican. There's everything there. My brother stopped and took a picture with a, a black guy who just so happened to have the same piece of shit shirt he has. It says, Romo makes me drink. <laughs> okay? My brother would have thought... Hey, no. that's better than Romo makes me horny. Yeah. Um, my brother had that shirt made by a friend of ours here in California. Mm -hmm. So he thought it was unique. We get over there and some and guy has the same shirt. <laughs> and it was funny because I told my brother, look, look, look. And he sees it. And the guy starts talking to my brother like they've been friends for... Yeah. It was funny, you know? And Similar like, to how when we were in Vegas, the guy with Fernie and the yeah, Raiders. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was funny because my brother took a picture with him. It's funny. He didn't work at Disneyland, you know? did he? No. No. <laughs> Automatically, there was a unification there regardless of skin color or anything. Mm -hmm. They're cowboy fans and they agreed with each other. You know, there was common ground. There was a unifying thing there. You know, there wasn't a... You know what, dude? I like your shirt, but you're, you're black. I can't I can't do that. Yeah. Or you're Hispanic. I, I don't hang out with Hispanics. I, I don't agree with you guys. There was not. It was an instant unifying moment. Even in the midst of where we were sitting, where I was the only one in the area as a Cincinnati fan, I was having some good conversation with that older black gentleman that I was talking to because he was into the game. I was into the game. He was asking me what I thought of my Knowledgeable. We were, we were going back and forth about football. You know, It's one of the things I love about football. It's unifying in the fact that even if you're an opposing fan, like I was in that situation, everybody around us, I don't want to say was accommodating, but they were tolerant of my difference of opinion in that situation as being a Bengal fan. We were all football fans. They just happened to be Dallas fan, and I happened to be a Bengal fan. Did I get heckled? Yes, but it was in good jest. You know, Did I get harassed? Yes, but it was in good jest. You know, We understood that there was a difference there. It was the liking of the teams, but we were still able to coexist with each other. Why does that only happen in football? I don't get why that why it only has to happen there. Why can't people step back and just go, we're different colors, but there's got to be some common ground here. Where is the common? Let's find the common ground and then figure out why the road splits. Mm -hmm. Not, hey, this road is split. You need to get over here on our road because that's what's going on. Yeah. You know, it's our road or it's no road. That's what we have going on. Instead of coming backwards and going, what's the common ground here? Well, in this instance, in these situations, the common ground is nobody wants anybody to have to die can't even use that as a common ground because if there's a vindictive policeman out there and he legitimately does not like and i'm gonna use black people in this instance because those are the ones that's that the one seem to be it yeah. seems to be shown more you know we're not hearing about cops shooting hispanics or whites we're hearing about cops shooting blacks if there's a white cop out there that legitimately doesn't like a black guy he's gonna kill him uh, i wish it wasn't like that i wish the world did not have that kind of hatred but it's just the way it is mm -hmm. you know so we need to go back and find a common ground well i think the common ground is to some degree we don't want anybody to die and if you're not on that ground, because to me, that's an encompassing goodwill thing. If you're not on that common ground and your road does split right then and there, you need to stop and think, man, what I'm doing is selfish. I'm trying to pass judgment on other people. You're going to see how much in the minority you really are. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those people who thinks, no, those people don't deserve to live or those people are a threat. Are there black people that are a threat? Yes, there are. Okay. Are there Mexicans that are a threat? Absolutely. Yep. Go to South Texas. I think people have some things to tell you about some of the Mexicans that come up that are cartel members and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, there are bad of every race. It's not just blacks. You know, they just happen to unfortunately be in the spotlight right now as the bad white cops do. Right. You know, a bad white cop and a bad black man. That's a that's a bad situation because someone's going to get shot, whether it's the cop or whether it's the, the, the black guy, you know. So we just got to go back and find unifying ground. And this weekend we found it. It was football. And I'm going to tell you what, we can coexist on that level, you know. We didn't see. I didn't see one fight, outside of the instant the, the the instance that my brother had. There was no fight there. You know, everybody coexisted. And I've been to Raider games where we saw fights. I've been to Charger games where we see fights. You know, it does happen, and it happens because people. I don't want to say are not tolerant, but 
your way is wrong, my way is right. And all of a sudden, it creates conflict. That's what creates a conflict, you know? So some of these, I've seen videos on uh, Instagram and YouTube and uh, Facebook where you see these protesters going on, you see Black Lives Matter protesting, and then you see All Lives Matter protesting. Now there's a big, if you don't know, there's a big rift between the two mm -hmm. because the black people feel, it's strictly... the Black Lives Matter feel like the All Lives Matter is taking some of the thunder from it and saying, yeah. hey, you're taking the focus off of what's wrong here. Yeah. And the All Lives Matter are saying, well, you're saying that you only you matter. So there's a big rift, but there are some instances where you see some videos where they'll actually go, hey, we can accomplish more together than we can separate. Let's yeah. protest together and we can fix the things that are wrong along. Yeah. And then both understanding that in that process, everything gets fixed, not just one. Yeah. You know, because each side has its own opinion. If you can come together and unify that opinion, you'll get a hell of a lot more done. Yeah. You know, then people have to listen because it's everybody, not just it's not one barking dog. It's a bunch of barking dogs. Right. You know, now the neighborhood knows something's wrong. You get one dog barking here, one dog barking there. It's just a, a disobedient dog, you know. But when the dogs in the neighborhood are barking, and I use dogs because I have dogs. Yeah. When the dogs in the neighborhood are barking, something ain't right. Yeah. You know something's not right. Whether it's the train passing or the fire engines going, you know something's wrong that they all agree with. So when the clan gets together, you can get more done. It just doesn't happen that way. So. Let me just say this though, also that like. Don't always believe that what you see in the media is the only thing going on. Holy shit, no. I think that's a big problem, too, is because people watch so much TV now, yeah. and they see videos online that that's the only thing going on. Yeah. And I think it's getting worse and worse with the fact that on YouTube, you can look up people getting killed. Yeah. And, like, watch it like it's nothing. Like, it's not, like, denied. It's not, like, flagged. It's not taken down. You can find literally anything on YouTube, minus... And this is what's weird. You can watch somebody being shot or an animal being killed. And I'm not talking like a hunting kill. No, you're talking like... Like legit, like a dog a almost attacks killing, them yeah. or like comes out and they stab the dog, shoot the dog, whatever, in broad daylight. You can find that on YouTube. But the one thing that they don't allow on there is any type of nudity. Yeah. Which to me doesn't make sense. Like, I'm not saying that nudity should be on there also if you're showing that. They both shouldn't be on there. Yeah. Because of the amount of access that everybody has to something like yeah. that. You know, from wide age, age group. My nephew, who is five, has been watching YouTube since he was three to watch everything from SpongeBob to uh, Bubble Guppies to all these little kid shows that are on there. Well, he's gotten in trouble several times now in the last six, seven months for watching videos that have turned into from regular videos to kids playing with toys and cussing and yeah. grown men talking about video games that he likes and they're cussing on there. Yeah. And he's gotten in trouble for watching that stuff. There's got to be a line at some point that is yeah. that needs to be drawn again. Like you said, like there's there's this point now where it's just so bad of you know unity where it has to everything's either on this side of the road or you're not on our side of the road, and that you know people's lives do matter. That like there's some people that feel that they don't like that shit. There has to be a line that's got to be drawn at some point to understand what you're being shown and. What makes sense? And I'm not I'm not a conspiracy theory person. I'm not I never have been. I mean there are interesting things, like I will watch certain things, like like the obviously the quote unquote magic bullet yeah. with JFK and like how did Oswald act alone? Like, I'm interested in hearing the arguments for and against that stuff, but to go into that and be like, No, I believe this for sure. I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah. You know. But I will say this that media puts out what people will bite on. Yeah. And just like the internet. If you'll click on it, they'll put that they'll put shit out, out there. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And so don't always believe that what you're seeing in a headline or what you're seeing on there is the only thing going on. Yeah. Because they know that what they're putting out is what you'll watch. Yeah. It's not... It's, I don't look at it and go, that's programmed in there. They're, they're trying to brainwash you. That's not what I'm saying. What they're trying to do is get your attention and get you to bite on what you saw. And if you do then they'll put more of that on there. Yep. And that's what's happened. The more controversial shit you've seen about people getting shot, black people getting shot with white officers, guess what? Suddenly that's all over the news. Yeah. You know, It was the same thing before when they were talking about Ebola. People freaked the fuck out about Ebola. What was all over the news? Ebola over here, Ebola over there. When people stopped caring about it and suddenly it was yesterday's news, when was the last time you heard about somebody who's dealing with that? It wasn't as big an issue as we thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. So keep that in mind when you're looking up things on this topic and going into detail on these topics that what you just see on TV or what you just see in a video online is not the only thing going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's for sure. Now, on a lighthearted note, 
of this country, they had the presidential debates. And I saw a hilarious video last night that although the, the debates were ridiculously out of hand, yeah. somebody edited a video together. And if you have ever seen the movie Dirty Dancing or No Patrick Swayze, you yeah. know the end of the movie that uh, they play the song I've Had the Time of My Life yeah. that he sings in the song. They put it, they they edited it together yeah. so it looks like Trump and I, Hillary are singing I to each other. That. It's, it's hilarious. hilarious. Yeah, you got to watch that. Yeah, so... Well, we uh, we finished on uh, some social issues. Yes, yes. <laughs> we did cover our sports. Uh, my brother will be in here on uh, Friday. He's coming down Friday again. We're gonna definitely go a little more of a yeah. lighthearted episode we're, for sure. We're gonna watch his uh, his godson play. He plays for Sanger High. Uh, we're gonna watch him play again. He's badass. He's a phenomenal athlete, sophomore. But um, he'll be in here. We'll share a little bit more about Dallas, about the trip we had. Um, always, it's always. Hey, you fun. know what? He's Military? Yes, he is. Military. We can ask him his opinion uh, on the Colin Kaepernick thing. We can, but I don't know if that's a good idea. Hey, it's, it's something to think about. Uh, we'll we'll kick it around a little bit. We'll mm. see. I I love my brother, um, but if you get him started on something passionate, uh, he, he will uh, dominate a conversation. <laughs> real that's <quick>. fine. <laughs> so we'll see what goes. Uh, I like to keep things lighthearted with him. Uh, Anytime we, I can keep his blood pressure down, we try to. <laughs> That's always a good yeah, thing. Yeah, it's always a good thing with him. Yeah, I love him to death, you know, but he, he, he has struggles. Let me that. say this. Uh, you posted several pictures on your personal Instagram yeah. page of you and your brother and being around Dallas yeah. in the stadium. Several kids came to me and said, that can't be Coach Manuel's brother. <laughs> the man is uh, one-third my size, yeah. um, uh, about four shades lighter than I am. <laughs> yeah. We get that all the time. Yeah. You know, we get it all the time, so we're used to it, but... Uh, all right, so this is uh, episode 30, 43. 43. 40, 40, I was going to say 31. <laughs> Somebody was asking me the other day. So my boy, uh, I'm going to give a shout-out real quick. My boy in Texas, um, I, I hadn't seen him since like 97. And uh, we were friends in high, all through high school, junior high. We went to Roosevelt together. Um, we, we grew up together, you know, and he – people end up in different spots. You know, he went to Denver for a little bit. He was in San Jose, ends up in Texas. And uh, I was able to visit with him for a little bit. It was badass. And nothing better than seeing an old friend – and knowing that you guys are still friends, you right? Know? Um, I put on my personal Instagram, uh, you know, it's no neither time nor distance can extinguish a true friendship. You know, I saw that guy, man. We gave each other the biggest hug, and we, we sat down, we drank beer together, we we're talking, we we're reminiscing. It's just awesome. Um, I, I had a great time with it. So I was telling him about the podcast. He's like, "You do a podcast?" I was like, "Yeah, me and my boy." And he's like, "What is it?" So he subscribed to it. Nice. So he shout out to him. So shout out to Smiley. Hey, out spread in, the uh, word, man. Spread Smiley the word. out in Weatherford, Texas. That's my boy. You know, if you're listening, give me a shout out today. So, um, maybe you said you're going to listen to this couple episodes. So maybe you listen to this. Hopefully, one, so. you listen to the yeah, new one. So. We'll get it up. Uh, I got a eat a big bag of dicks segment for the show. Okay. Okay. So this weekend, the girlfriend and I decided we we're going to have a, a nice dinner uh, for the week on Saturday. Uh, uh-huh. We're like, hey, let's go out to dinner, just have ourselves an enjoyable time, relax, right? Uh-huh. So. She wanted to go to Cheesecake Factory. Okay. Okay. So I said, okay, you know, we'll go to Cheesecake Factory. It's Saturday. It'll probably be a little bit busy. You know, we're, we're going to get into that time as far as dinner time anyway, right? So we go, and we get there. Not a long wait. I mean, 10 minutes, we were seated. Not a bad spot. Uh, we sat down, and the seating, like the, because we were in a booth. Mm-hmm. So the seats were dirty as shit. Like little kids had just oh, completely got it, and just crumbs everywhere. Table was half-assed clean. I was like, okay, and like I used to work, like I said, in the food business, so I get some of it when it's busy, and I understand, but for the most part, like, it's like, come on, it's a, ta- you know people are going to be yeah, eating it, right? Yeah, you need to clean that shit up. So, we're sitting there, and then we're looking at the menu, and we're talking about what we're going to get, this and that, and I'm seeing steak, and I'm thinking like, oh, I'm going to get me some steak for sure. She's looking at the menu. She turned me on to salmon. I'm not, I, I wasn't a big salmon fan before she kind of put it out there and I started cooking it and figuring yeah. things out about it. So I said, you know what? I'm going to get the steak and salmon, right? So she decided she's going to have the steak. So we order our food and it took a little bit, but it was busy. Yeah. So it was understood as to why it took so yeah. long. They bring my plate first, okay? I kid you not. It was four pieces of steak that were the size of silver dollars. <laughs> and then... It was salmon that was oh, well, uh, laying on top of asparagus with a white sauce underneath it. Now, you know I'm picky. Yes. Okay. Well, luckily, the skin from the salmon was the barrier between, between the sauce, the sauce and yeah. the, so I could eat the salmon without any issues. About two minutes later, her plate comes out. And the guy comes over and he goes to, like, as he's putting it in front of her and setting it down, 
I see something that looks odd. And on my steak, she ordered the exact same thing. So they had its own sauce. It was like a wine okay. with some sort of sauce with uh, onions, caramelized onions, and mushrooms on top. And I just pushed those off because I don't eat that, right? Yeah. As I look at her plate, I was like, something looks weird. That's, that's not a mushroom. A fucking paper napkin that was rolled up, dude, into a ball had hit that white sauce and had white sauce on it. And that was on the middle of her fucking plate. And they set it down in front of her. And I went, what the hell? And she looked down and went, what the fuck? So then, like, the dude hands it off and walks off. Yeah. Waitress comes back around and she's like, excuse me, this is in my plate. Not rude. Not like, hey, what the fuck? Like, she just said, this was on my plate when the guy brought it. This what? Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. She rushes it off to the back. The girlfriend looks at me and she goes, I got a bad feeling. They're just going to dump it on another plate and yeah. bring it back out to me. That's why you don't send food back. I mean, not that you would have kept that. But oh, right. Yeah, so mean. then this smaller guy who's in nice like <clears throat> suit attire with minus the jacket comes out and he apologizes like 10 times over. You know, can we get you a salad while you wait? We're remaking the food. All of it is what he tells us. The amount of time it took, it made sense that they actually remade it. They bring the food out. The, the food itself was mediocre at best. Yeah. It was like almost blasé. Then, to finish it off, she comes back and brings the check. Like, no problem. Like, not like, hey, we'll pay for part of your, for her meal. Not like, we'll pick yeah. up the check. Not a goddamn thing. Yeah. No, that's... So, to the people at the Cheesecake Factory, you are this segment's Eat a Big Bag of Dicks. <laughs> and this has been your Eat a Big Bag of Dicks segment. <laughs> That's going to be a new we're segment. Gonna do that every That's day. a new segment for the okay, show. Okay, so Friday will have to be mine. I'll have yes. to figure out. We'll each be. do one. Well, you know what? I'll have one from Dallas, actually. So Perfect. Actually, my brother will. Um, we'll have two on Friday. Yeah. One for you, one for okay, him. Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll do that on so Friday. So from now on, one episode a week, I'll have a segment. The other one okay. is yours. That'll work for me. So, so there you all go. Right. There's your eat a big bag of dick segment. <laughs> so... All right. Well, as usual, you can hit us up on Instagram or uh, or YouTube. Yep. Instagram's totally underscore unprofessional. Make sure you like, share, comment, tell your friends about us. Tell your friends, and they'll tell their friends, and we can be friends. There you go. <laughs> on uh, YouTube, we're at Totally Unprofessional Podcast. Uh, you can see as we have the different colorway slides of what the episodes look like with the different fonts and everything. Uh, you can listen to us either way. Uh, so that way, if you want to put it on your TV, you have a smart TV, yeah. you can watch it on YouTube and listen to it while you work around the house cleaning, doing whatever you do, uh, dishes, all that good stuff. If you want to download it, we're in Podbean. That's in the Instagram bio. There's a little thumb emoji pointing down. You just touch the link. It takes you straight to there, and you can go from there. You can subscribe to there, so that way you get them automatically. Every oh, time yeah. we upload them, bam, you know about it. So for uh, episode 43, Manuel's back from Dallas. We're holding it down on this side out in California. I'm Justin. And Manuel. And we've been totally, totally unprofessional. unprofessional.